、英語聞き流し10分間、名作リスニング、英語テキストと、MP3 ダウンロード、その他の物語は、ホームページよりご利用いただけます。88thpp.com。88thpp.com。She hobbled up to the children and asked, in a snuffling voice, Have you the grass here that sings or the bird that is blue? We have some grass, replied Tildal, trembling all over his body, but it can't sing. Tildal has a bird, said Mytel. But I can't give it away, because it's mine, the little fellow added, quickly. Now wasn't that a capital reason? The fairy put on her big, round glasses and looked at the bird. He's not blue enough, she exclaimed. I must absolutely have the blue bird. It's for my little girl, who is very ill. Do you know what the blue bird stands for? No? I thought you didn't, and, as you are good children, I will tell you. The fairy raised her crooked finger to her long, pointed nose, and whispered, in a mysterious tone. The blue bird stands for happiness, and I want you to understand that my little girl must be happy in order to get well. That is why I now command you to go out into the world and find the blue bird for her. You will have to start at once. Do you know who I am? The children exchanged puzzled glances. The fact was that they had never seen a fairy before, and they felt a little scared in her presence. However, Taupel soon said politely, You are rather like our neighbor, Madame Berlingot. She herself helped Mytel. Taupel thought that, in saying this, he was paying the fairy a compliment. For Madame Berlingot's shop, which was next door to their cottage, was a very pleasant place. It was stocked with sweets, marbles, chocolate cigars, and sugar dolls and hens, and, at fair time, there were big gingerbread dolls covered all over with gilt paper. Goody Berlingot had a nose that was quite as ugly as the fairy's, she was old also, and, like the fairy, she walked doubled up in two, but she was very kind and she had a dear little girl who used to play on Sundays with the woodcutter's children. Unfortunately, the poor little pretty, fair haired thing was always suffering from some unknown complaint, which often kept her in bed. When this happened, she used to beg and pray for Tildal's dove to play with, but Tildal was so fond of the bird that he would not give it to her. All this, thought the little boy, was very like that which the fairy told him, and that was why he called her Berlingot. Much to his surprise, the fairy turned crimson with rage. It was a hobby of hers to be like nobody. Because she was a fairy and able to change her appearance, from one moment to the next, as she pleased. That evening, she happened to be ugly and old and humpbacked, she had lost one of her eyes, and two lean wisps of gray hair hung over her shoulders. What do I look like? she asked Tildal. Am I pretty or ugly? Old or young? Her reason for asking these questions was to try the kindness of the little boy. He turned away his head and dared not say what he thought of her looks. Then she cried. I am the fairy b a r a l o o n Oh, that's all right. Answered Tildal, who, by this time, was shaking in every limb. This satisfied the fairy, and, as the children were still in their nightshirts, she told them to get dressed. She herself helped m i t e l and, while she did so, asked, Where are your father and mother? In there, said Tildal, pointing to the door on the right. They're asleep. And your granddad and granny? They're dead. And your little brothers and sisters? Have you any? Oh, yes, three little brothers, said Tildal. And four little sisters, added m i t e l Where are they? asked the fairy. They are dead, too, answered Tildal. Would you like to see them again? Oh, yes. At once. Show them to us. I haven't them in my pocket, said the fairy. But this is very lucky. You will see them when you go through the land of memory. It's on the way to the blue bird, just on the left, past the third turning. What were you doing when I knocked? We were playing at eating cakes, said t a l t l Have you any cakes? Where are they? In the house of the rich children. Come and look, it's so lovely. And t a l t l dragged the fairy to the window. But it's the others who are eating them, said she. Yes, but we can see them eat, said t a l t l Aren't you cross with them? What for? For eating all the cakes. I think it's very wrong of them not to give you any. Not at all, they're rich. I say, isn't it beautiful over there? It's just the same here, only you can't see. 
Yes, I can, said Tyvel. I have very good eyes. I can see the time on the church clock, and Daddy can't. The fairy suddenly grew angry. I tell you that you can't see, she said. And she grew angrier and angrier, as though it mattered about seeing the time on the church clock. Of course, the little boy was not blind, but as he was kind-hearted and deserved to be happy, she wanted to teach him to see what is good and beautiful in all things. It was not an easy task, for she well knew that most people live and die without enjoying the happiness that lies all around them. Still, as she was a fairy, she was all powerful, and so she decided to give him a little hat adorned with a magic diamond that would possess the extraordinary property of always showing him the truth, which would help him to see the inside of things and thus teach him that each of them has a life and an existence of its own, created to match and gladden ours. The fairy took the little hat from a great bag hanging by her side. It was green and had a white cockade, with a big diamond shining in the middle of it. Tylthel was beside himself with delight. The fairy explained to him how the diamond worked. By pressing the top, you saw the soul of things. If you gave it a little turn to the right, you discovered the past, and when you turned it to the left, you beheld the future. Tylthel beamed all over his face and danced for joy, and then he at once became afraid of losing the little hat. Daddy will take it from me, he cried. No, said the fairy, for no one can see it as long as it's on your head. Will you try it? Yes, yes, cried the children, clapping their hands. The hat was no sooner on the little boy's head than a magic change came over everything. The old fairy turned into a young and beautiful princess, dressed all in silk and covered with sparkling jewels. The walls of the cottage became transparent and gleamed like precious stones. The humble deal furniture shone like marble. The two children ran from right to left, clapping their hands and shouting with delight. "Oh, how lovely! How lovely!" exclaimed Tyldall. And Mytel, like the vain little thing she was, stood spellbound before the beauty of the fair princess' dress. But further and much greater surprises were in store for them. Had not the fairy said that the things and the animals would come to life, talk, and behave like everybody else? Lo and behold! Suddenly, the door of the grandfather's clock opened. The silence was filled with the sweetest music, and twelve little daintily dressed and laughing dancers began to skip and spin all around the children. They are the hours of your life," said the fairy. "May I dance with them?" asked Tyldall, gazing with admiration at those pretty creatures who seemed to skim over the floor like birds. But just then he burst into a wild fit of laughter. "Who was that funny fat fellow, all out of breath and covered with flour, who came struggling out of the bread pan and bowing to the children?" It was bread, bread himself, taking advantage of the reign of liberty to go for a little walk on earth. He looked like a stout, comical old gentleman. His face was puffed out with dough, and his large hands, at the end of his thick arms, were not able to meet when he laid them on his great round stomach. He was dressed in a tight-fitting crust-colored suit with stripes across the chest like those on the nice buttered rolls which we have for breakfast in the morning. On his head, just think of it. He wore an enormous bun. Which made a funny sort of turban. He had hardly tumbled out of his pan when other loaves just like him, but smaller, followed after and began to frisk about with the hours, without giving a thought to the flour which they scattered over those pretty ladies and which wrapped them in great white clouds. It was a queer and charming dance, and the children were delighted. The hours waltzed with the loaves, the plates, joining in the fun, hopped up and down on the dresser at the risk of falling off and smashing to pieces. The glasses in the cupboard clinked together to drink the health of one and all. As to the forks, they chattered so loudly with the knives that you could not hear yourself speak for the noise. There is no knowing what would have happened if the din had lasted much longer. Daddy and Mummy Dill would certainly have waked up. Fortunately, when the romp was at its height, an enormous flame darted out of the chimney and filled the room with a great red glow, as though the house were on fire. Everybody bolted into the corners in dismay. While Tyvel and Mytel, sobbing with fright, hid their heads under the good fairy's cloak, "Don't be afraid," she said. "It's only fire who has come to join in your fun. He is a good sort, but you had better not touch him, for he has a hot temper." Peeping anxiously through the beautiful gold lace that edged the fairy's cloak, the children saw a tall, red fellow looking at them and laughing at their fears. He was dressed in scarlet tights and spangles. From his shoulders hung silk scarves that were just like flames when he waved them with his long arms, and his hair stood up on his head in straight, flaring locks. He started flinging out his arms and legs and jumping round the room like a madman. 
Tileville, though feeling a little easier, dared not yet leave his refuge. Then the fairy Baraloon had a capital idea, she pointed her wand at the tap, and at once there appeared a young girl who wept like a regular fountain. It was water. She was very pretty, but she looked extremely sad, and she sang so sweetly that it was like the rippling of a spring. Her long hair, which fell to her feet, might have been made of seaweed. She had nothing on but her bedgown, but the water that streamed over her clothed her in shimmering colors. She hesitated at first and gave a glance around her, then, catching sight of fire still whirling about like a great madcap, she made an angry and indignant rush at him, spraying his face, splashing and wetting him with all her might. Fire flew into a rage and began to smoke. Nevertheless, as he found himself suddenly thwarted by his old enemy, he thought it wiser to retire to a corner. Water also beat a retreat, and it seemed as though peace would be restored once more. The two children, at last recovering from their alarm, were asking the fairy what was going to happen next, when a startling noise of breaking crockery made them look round towards the table. What a surprise! The milk jug lay on the floor, smashed into a thousand fragments, and from the pieces rose a charming lady, who gave little screams of terror and clasped her hands and turned up her eyes with a beseeching glance. Audiobook. Living in Kyoto by Hitomi Woods. Now on sale in online stores. 44 available distributors. Apple, Google Play, Amazon Audible, or else. ひでみうつがデザインしたとっても可愛いオリジナルグッズが手に入る。トートバッグ、缶バッジ、ステッカー、T エリゼンドットコム英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストとMP3ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます。88thpp.com 88thpp.com Thank you.